Hey everyone, I'm Julie. I'm a 3D artist and I stream 3D modeling on Twitch. Today I'm going to show you how I made this isometric New York inspired diorama. In this video, we're going to be sketching out the composition of the scene. I wanted to start this tutorial by mentioning the first and a very important part of making a project like this gathering references. These are some of the references I used for this project. I just saved most New York things I could think of, like a typical New York apartment building, subway, subway station, subway train, New York taxi, New York park. You don't realize how little you remember about what the real world looks like before you start recreating it in 3D. So that's why I think references are crucial. Here I'm starting to make four floating islands that are going to have different distinctly New York things on them. In the bottom right corner, you will notice the shortcuts I'm using. For example, here you can see me pressing Ctrl FF instead of going to the face menu and pressing extrude faces along normals. Utilizing shortcuts is definitely the best and intended way to use Blender. To make an object look smooth in Blender, you need to right click on the object, shade smooth, go to object data properties, in normals, enable auto smooth and enter a number. And here you'll see me do the same thing using just one shortcut. I'm going to do that a lot in this video. This is because I'm using a custom made add-on that makes accessing operators I use a lot easier. So everything I'm going to do this way, you can also do in Blender without this add-on. I almost never sketch out my ideas in 2D these days. I go directly to Blender and start blocking out the scene. While I'm working on composition, I find it really useful to have the final image in mind. That's why I try to set up a camera as early as possible. At this stage, I used simple placeholder graphics to block out the entire scene without adding too much detail to any single object. I'm working on a composition first. Otherwise, I risk spending time detailing objects that might not work together as a whole. So on this stage, I'm trying to keep models as simple as possible. In this case, I just want to decide where the building is going to go, how tall it's going to be, and an overall shape of the building, and then move on to the next object. Another thing I try to figure out early on is scale, human scale. How tall would a human be in this scene? Knowing that doesn't stop you from exaggerating the proportions, of course, if you're going for a stylized look. That's actually what I'm going for here. You see, my main portfolio website is Instagram, so I think about what my work is going to look like there when I'm making it. That's why I try not to add too many details that you won't be able to see there. I'm a big fan of making more things instead of making one perfect thing. Especially when you're learning, because your 10th project is going to be that much better than your first one. So why delay making it? As one of my favorite YouTube videos taught me, fail faster. Here I'm starting to make a new object, a hot dog stand. And what you just saw me do is copy an existing face from an object and separate it, rather than make a new plane. I usually do that because it's faster than creating a new object, because that requires moving the 3D cursor in the correct place first. Here you just saw me add a circle to the center of the face. I did it using the add-on I mentioned earlier, but you can do it without any add-ons, of course. So let me show you how to do that. Let's say you want to create a circle on this face. Select the face, press Shift S and drag the mouse down. Snap to axis perpendicular to the face, create a circle. In the Redo menu, change a line from World to View. And we have a circle in the center of the face. You've probably noticed that just now I suggested using Alt Middle Mouse button for snapping to an axis, instead of pressing a number on a numpad. That's because I rarely use numpad, because I try to do as many things as I can with my left hand in Blender, so that my right hand always stays on a mouse. That's just much faster, and eventually your left hand develops muscle memory, so you don't have to look at the keyboard and uh, it just presses things magically. Just like touch typing works, you know? Trying to be fast when modeling is not necessary at all, but it's very convenient. At least I find it convenient. Especially when you want to quickly sketch your initial idea. I've heard people say that they find Blender unintuitive because of how much it relies on your knowledge of hotkeys. I personally feel the opposite, because with time, these hotkeys become second nature and nothing is stopping you anymore from making your ideas come to life almost instantly. So it doesn't take that much effort to make things and you can spend more time on designing things. 
Speaking of making things more efficiently, by menus. In my Twitch chat, I see a lot of beginners asking how to do things that I use by menus for. So I wanted to show you by menus that I use regularly and most useful operators there, in my opinion. Shift S. I use cursor to select it all the time. Sometimes select it to cursor and to reset the cursor to the world origin, I use Shift C. Z by menu, I use all the time to switch between material preview, solid, and rendered mode. To switch to wireframe, I use Shift Z. Greater than is another essential by menu. I feel like switching pivot points from median to individual origins to a 3D cursor is what I'm doing 90% of the time I'm modeling in Blender. By the way, only locations is a killer feature. I use it to move objects away from each other without changing their scale. Less than by menu, you use to switch orientation. By the way, while using by menus, I find it faster to just move the mouse in the direction I need, but you can also use numbers that are written next to the operator. Tilde menu is the reason you can get away with not using a numpad, but for snapping to axis, I use alt middle mouse button, like I said. Another proof of tilde menu being very important is that in Blender 3.0, it's probably going to be moved to D button because it's easier to access. Back to the time lapse. Here I'm creating this convex shape and then beveling it to the point where it looks like part of a sphere. Then I merge vertices by distance. You don't want to have multiple vertices in the same place, so I use merge by distance a lot. That's why I moved it to quick favorites. It's Q button. Another useful tip I thought I'd share is something that wasn't obvious to me when I just started using Blender. Accelerate your keys. In any menu you open, you can use numbers or letters to access menu items instead of clicking them with your mouse. Let me show you this with the example of Add Menu. Let's say you just deleted the default cube, and naturally you want to add a new cube to start off your model. Shift A hotkey opens Add Menu. Then in this example, you can press 1 for Mesh Submenu and 2 to add a cube. Have you noticed how some of the letters are underlined? That means you can use that letter as an accelerator key instead of a number. So an alternate way to add a cube would be to press Shift A, M, C. Think of how would you add a circle curve then? Yes, Shift A, 22, or Shift A, C, C. If you're wondering how do I choose whether to use a number or a letter for accessing an operator, the answer is easy. Just use whichever one is more comfortable. I prefer to use my left hand because I can press keys without looking at the keyboard this way. So if I'm choosing between the number 8 and the letter C, for example, I would choose C. It might seem difficult at first, especially if you don't already touch type. You know, typing without looking at the keyboard? I myself wasn't touch typing when I just started learning Blender, so it took some time to get used to this. When I just started, I would practice adding things fast. So I would just sit there trying to add and delete cube multiple times without looking at the keyboard, and now my hand just does that without me even realizing it. Very convenient. Unfortunately, the add-on I'm using doesn't show accelerator keys, and I haven't found any add-on that does that. So if you know one, let me know in the comments, I'd love to hear it. There are some operators and tools I use that are located inconveniently, like isolate on forward slash, or greater than and less than by menus that I mentioned earlier. But one operator I use too often to deal with inconvenient placement of a hotkey is select linked. So if you've been paying attention to the time lapse, and you were confused by what's up with me pressing C all the time, that's why. If you don't know, select linked operator selects geometry connected to already selected elements, so what's called an island in Blender. If you have multiple meshes like this within one object, select linked will help you select just one. I use it constantly, and by default the hotkey for it is Control L. I can't press Control L without looking at the keyboard for the life of me, so I changed it. I switch the hotkeys between select linked and circle select, because I barely use circle select, and originally it was bound to C key, which is very conveniently located. To change the key binding, by the way, you go to Edit, Preferences, Key Map, search for the operator by the name or the key binding, and change it. So what I'm trying to say, I guess, is try things. See what works for you, what doesn't. If something really doesn't, you can always change it. Though I wouldn't go changing too many things, because then you run into a new problem. When you need to reinstall Blender, update it, or just use it somewhere new, every time you'd need to go and rebind all the keys to the way you used to. And that's not really convenient. Same goes for add-ons. I try to use as little add-ons as possible, actually. I mean the ones that are not built in Blender. My reasoning being, 
I don't want to rely on third-party developers too much to the point where I can't do my work without them. I feel like less people I depend on, the better in this case. I also love trying new versions of Blender as soon as they come out, so relying on add-ons means that I'd have to wait, and you don't know for how long. Here you can see me start working on the last floating island. In this last island, I'm working a lot with booleans. Booleans are really awesome, because alternative would be to add a lot of loop cuts, and it gets really complicated really quickly. Boolean is great for that. It's also a non-destructive method, so you can readjust things at any point. To add boolean, I'm using custom-made add-on that I mentioned before, but you can always just go to modifiers and add boolean from there. Something that I find really useful, and something that the add-on is already doing for me, is changing the way the object that you boolean with is displayed in the viewport. Here is how you do it. Go to object properties on the right, in viewport display, change display as to wire. Here I'm adding subdivision surface modifier early, and then editing the object by adding loop cuts. Something I haven't talked about yet is what the idea was behind this piece in the first place. I imagined a floating island scene, something that would remind you of a city building strategy game, where you need to position islands to build your city. Let's say you have different islands with different functions, like a housing island, a park island. Placing a park island would upgrade all your housing islands nearby. Then I decided to make a transportation island, and I thought it would be a cool idea to have two of them, so that having to align them correctly would present an extra challenge. To be clear, I'm not making game-ready assets here. This was just the inspiration behind this work. And I don't think you necessarily need to have such an elaborate plan of what you're making. But I think it does help. It gives you extra ideas, another way of looking at your scene, so that you can add extra bits of visual storytelling. You know, little details that tell you a little bit more about this world. Here I'm making a subway bench. And as you can see, I didn't go with most iconic design, that wooden bench you can see in New York subway. And I'm trying to add the most New York things I could think of, right? So why wouldn't I add that bench? That's because it doesn't look like a typical bench we're used to seeing everywhere. It has such an unusual shape that it would look odd in a scene like this. Maybe people who've been to New York subway would recognize the bench, but to everybody else it would look like I designed something weird there. That's why, in a scene full of different objects like this one, I go for the simplest and instantly recognizable designs of everyday objects. Something I realized is that I don't need to make everything 100% true to life. What I care about more is whether something works for the scene or not. Especially in a stylized scene like this. That's what I do with lights, by the way. I just lie. I add as many lights as I need. And half the time, I don't even have the light source for it. I've heard people say that you have to have a light source in your scene. And of course, if you can add one, it's better to have it there, for it to make sense where in the world the light is coming from. But if you can't, and you know that adding that light will make the image look better, I just add it anyway. In the end, that's what people care about, if it looks good. I'm adding a subway entrance, and this completes the overall composition. Time to add a bevel modifier and set up the lights. For my main light, I use Sky Texture Nishita. It's the easiest way I found to quickly add a good lighting. It lets you adjust the angle of the sun and its intensity. Besides the main light, I add a couple of rim lights. They help to visually separate your objects from the background. And our composition is complete. Working this way helps me visualize the final image early and saves a lot of time. If you try applying this method or any of the tips I gave you to your work, please share the results with me on Twitter or Instagram. I will make separate videos modeling every individual island in detail. Subscribe not to miss those videos. Thank you for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.